Since the beginning of time, God has been pursuing mankind. His pursuit is steadfast and unwavering. His love is resolute and unmatched. From the moment of our first breath, we have all been searching for hope. In every human heart, there is a longing for true purpose and meaning. There is a sense that we were meant for more. Our city is filled with people searching for truth, searching for answers. These answers can't be found in quick fixes, self-help books, or our limited ability to understand the meaning of life. Eternity is within us. The kingdom of God isn't a place, it's a people who are pursued by their creator and are found in the midst of their searching. You see, where the pursuit of God and the searching of mankind collide, there is Jesus. The bridge to the one true God, Jesus. The beginning and the end, Jesus. The perfect example of perfect love, Jesus. The one who loves us in spite of our failures, takes our worst and gives us his best, Jesus. The way, the truth, and the life, the one who broke the chains of our sin, the one who has the power to heal and restore, the one who defeated death and rose victorious on the third day, Jesus. No other name is higher, no other name is greater, no other name than the one we celebrate today, Jesus. Jesus. Amen, amen, amen. Welcome in, guys. I am Pastor Nate. I'm the pastor here in Living Waters Church here in the state of Missouri. And we're finishing up the book of Hebrews. Are you guys excited? We've worked all the way through Hebrews. We're finally at the last chapter. I think we've seen a lot of growth in individuals as well as myself really going through this book and breaking it down. Amen. Um, so what I want to do this morning is really dig into the word. So you guys ready to dig into the word? I've got so much joy in me right now. It's going to be hard to contain. You're probably going to see a different Pastor Nate than uh, you've seen in, in quite a while because I've been battling physically. I've been battling spiritually, and I, I, I'm just overjoyed right now in the presence of God. Amen. So go ahead and turn your Bibles to chapter 13, Hebrews chapter 13, and we're going to dive in this word this morning. Amen. So verse 1, it starts. It says, let brotherly love continue. Be not forgetful to entertain strangers, for thereby some have entertained angels unaware. Remember them that are in bonds as bonds with them, and them which suffer adversity as being yourselves also in the body. Marriage is honorable in all, and the bed undefiled. But whoremongers and adulterers God will judge. Let your conversation be without covetousness, and be content with such things as ye have, for he hath said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. Thank you, Jesus. So that we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper, and I will not fear what man shall do unto me. Remember them which have the rule over you, who have spoken unto you the word of God, whose faith follow, considering the end of their conversation. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever, be not carried about with diverse and strange doctrines. For it is good thing that the heart be established with grace, not with meats, which have not profited them that have been occupied therein. We have an altar whereof they have no right to eat, which serve the tabernacle. For the body of those beasts whose blood is brought into the sanctuary by the high priest for sin are burned without the camp. Wherefore, Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people with his own blood, suffered without the gate. Let us go forth, <coughs> let us go forth therefore, unto him without the camp, bringing, bearing his reapproach. For here have we no continuing city, but we seek one to come. By him, therefore, let us offer the sacrifice of praise to God continually. That is the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. But to do good and to communicate, forget not. For with such sacrifices, God is well pleased. Obey them that have the rule over you and submit yourselves, for they watch for your souls. As they that must give account, and they may do it with joy and not with grief, for that is unprofitable for you. Pray for us. For we trust we have a good conscience in all things, willingly to live honestly. But I beseech you the rather to do this, that I may be restored to you sooner. Now the God of peace that brought again from the dead, our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant, make you perfect in every good work to do his will, working in you that which is well-pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ. 
to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. And I beseech you, brethren, suffer the word of exhortation. For I have written a letter unto you in few words. Know ye that our brother Timothy is set at liberty, with whom, if he comes shortly, I will see you. Salute all them that have the rule over you, and all the saints, they of Italy, salute you. Grace be with you all. The word of the Lord this morning. Amen. So this morning, I want to start off by asking you a question. And I want to see if we're all in harmony with this question. And the question is this this morning. Do you enjoy sci-fi book, movies, or books? Do you, do you really enjoy sci-fi movies or books? Okay, so I'm seeing some no's. I'm seeing some yeses. But if you answered yes to this question, then this chapter is going to give you a real treat. This chapter is going to give you a real treat if you, if you do like sci-fi movies and books. Now, I want you to suppose that you came across a young homeless couple in your town. Would you invite them to stay at your house until they could find adequate lodging? You might be thinking right now, I know where you're going, Pastor. You're going and you're thinking of Mary and Joseph when there was no room at that inn, right? Well, in a way, I want you to think about this condition. And I would say that out of the majority of people here, that you would make up an excuse that the couple could not stay at your home. And here's just a few of the excuses that would probably pop in your head. And I want you to see if any of these excuses fit what you're thinking for not letting them come to your house. We're too busy. We're too busy to let them come and stay at our house. Our house is too messy. It's, it's too expensive to feed company. We don't have the funds to do so. It's hard at this stage of life to be able to really help someone else when we can barely help ourselves. I don't have time to cook and I don't know how to cook. I already have roommates. I don't have a good place to cook or seat people in my tiny apartment. We just had a baby and our house isn't toddler proof. We don't know who they are. They could possibly be terrorists or serial unalivers or maybe they're wanted by the police. We just don't know who they are. And you're probably wondering, well, Pastor, we're talking about Hebrews 13. Why did you bring this up? Why did you bring this up? And perfectly, our precious Holy Spirit has led us to this chapter today. In the book of Hebrews. And we read in verse 2 that we can possibly come across angels in our day-to-day -day activity. Think about this. Have you ever come across any situation where you experience an interaction with someone and you can't figure out what exactly happened? You can't figure out why you came across this person. You can't figure out why you were talking to this person. You don't even understand how that person got there. Well, this final chapter begins with further exhortations to the people to whom the letter is addressed here. And the exhortation is to the love of fellow Christians, followed by how that love can practically be revealed who they are especially to. I want you to see this this morning. We're to show loving hospitality to foreign Christian visitors. We're to care for those in bonds for Christ's sake, showing them true love. Do you know what that's saying? You're supposed to show love to those Christians that are locked up. We're to ensure the establishment of truly loving godly marriages and avoid sexual misbehavior. We're to be free of money, the love of money, which would destroy their love for God and for others. We're to look obediently to faithful leaders in loving response. And we're not to listen to false teaching, which would destroy the love for one another. Amen. 
So together with the original urge to reveal brotherly love, these instructions make up seven in total. The number of divine perfection. The number seven represents divine perfection. And each of these relate in some way to brotherly love. The, the, the first two examples were of outgoing love, both at home and outside. The second two are examples of the major moral dangers facing Christians, which could affect their love for one another. And the third two warn of the need to respond to godly leaders and beware of heresy in order by, that their love may be maintained. Amen. You guys ready to dig into this? Verse 1. Verse 1, it says, let brotherly love continue. We see that this point of the letter is speaking about us wonderful brothers and sisters from Philadelphia. The, the, the city of brotherly love here. And if you believe this, I have a, a bridge that's for sale. If you believe that it's only speaking to Philadelphia, if you believe that it's only speaking to, to Houston, Texas, if you believe that it's only speaking to Jerusalem, if you believe that it's only speaking to St. Louis, Missouri, if you believe that it's only speaking to Los Angeles, California, I've got a bridge that I can sell you. Because as the first exhortation after the climax of the letter, it demonstrates that this is a central to his thinking. Because without love, everything else is irrelevant. I'm going to say that one more time. Without love, everything else is irrelevant. The word used emphasized love among Christians. And the writer, he, he's probably... Um, especially had in mind to address those who forsook the assembling of themselves together. And you'll see that back in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 25. But the idea here is that it's applying to all Christians. This love has little to do with deep affection or romantic love. But it's a love which is true and reveals itself in what? In the action of the believers. So it's a love that's, that the, the Holy Spirit is producing the fruit of that others can see and can take from. It's not one that you express for your wife or your child. It's a love that people can pull things from. It's a pure love, an agape love. And these Christians were, this Christian love was urged by Christ as an essential element of being a Christian as it's defined in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. And now the writer's really going to break down exactly what he's talking about here when he's talking about the love that we're to show. Amen. Verse 2 says, do not forget to show loving hospitality to strangers. For as a result of that, some have entertained angels unaware. The first exhortation reveals that Christians should be always receptive of others. Do you know what the fruit of the Spirit long suffering means? Does anybody know what the fruit of the Spirit long suffering means? In order to be long-suffering, you have to endure the length of it even though, even though there may be, like Giving Grace said, ups and downs and peaks and valleys, twists and turns. You have to endure this. And the only way that you can endure this is through the Holy Spirit and by the love that the Holy Spirit is showing you. Because when the Holy Spirit loves you, you can love others. Amen. You can love others. The second here is going to show that they must be willing to go out to put themselves out for others. Our love is supposed to be receptive and outgoing. You can't just expect someone to love you without you loving back. I have to receive the love in order to give the love. So the writers here, he's saying it's got to be receptive and outgoing. 
And in the days when inns were few and doubtful, finding hospitality was always a problem for these Christian travelers. These Christians, therefore, to ensure that they offer loving hospitality to the visitors as they travel. But what's amazing is that it was especially important for them to open their home, for them to open their home to those who were unknown to them personally. Because it just might be that our holy ruler, Jesus Christ, sent some of his angels our way to see how we would respond. I truly believe that we're tested on a daily basis. And I truly believe that the Hebrew church was tested on a daily basis to see how you were going to respond in action of love. We can truly never know who the strangers to whom we offer hospitality might be. There's kind of a sense that we can because we can be sure that they are Jesus for when we welcome them in, in his name, we welcome our Lord Jesus. But this is not intended to be the motive here. It's only an added spur. The thought is that such hospitality earns its own rewards. And we can never know who or what those whom we benefit might be for God and perform in his service. And by our hospitality, we will be part of that service. Remember, Matthew chapter 10, verse 42 says this. To give a cup of cold water to a disciple or as a disciple in the name of Christ is to be deserving of reward. We don't know who we're entertaining daily. We don't know if it's an angel. I can give you multiple examples, but my examples aren't going to push you into doing it yourself. Verse 3 says, remember them that are in bonds as bound with them, and them which suffer adversity as being yourselves also in the body. The second practical example of Christian love is that of caring for. You're to care for them. You're to be watching out for them. And who's who's these them that he's talking about? He's talking about those who are in bonds for Christ's sake. They are to remember such people as though it were themselves who were bound for Christ's sake. This was especially important in that prisoners were expected to find their own means of sustenance at the hands of friends and relatives, and Christian prisoners would have needed the encouragement in facing the consequence of persecution. I told you this already. That when you're locked up, yes, today they give you food, but that food is not enough. If anybody's been locked up, you, they'll tell you the food is not enough. You're still hungry. And unless your family and your friends put money on your books, known as commissary, you're only eating what they provide. As in the days of the Hebrews. The Christians would have had to provide the necessities and the food for their fellow brothers and sisters while they were incarcerated. And it was, of course, always a risky business given this help. Because it might also brand the helper as being a Christian. So they're going out on the limb to take their brothers and sisters food and substance and encouragement. But yet they're putting themselves in danger because they could be labeled as a Christian and be bound with who they went to see. Are you guys understanding this this morning? They could have been bound right along with the prisoner that was already there. Onesiphorus was a living example of this principle in 2 Timothy 1.16. And Paul says of him, he says, He often refreshed me and was not ashamed of my chain. But when he was in Rome, he sought me diligently and found me. Not only did he provide Paul with food and substance, but he gave him company in his imprisonment and went to go to great trouble to find out where he was being held so that he could do so and would continue to do so. 
just as they were to imagine themselves as bound with them, so were they also to remember that they are in a body like that of the, those prisoners who are being ill-treated. And they were to emphasize with them in their sufferings and to seek to help them in any way possible. Just as they would wish for the same if they were in that situation. Wouldn't you want somebody to come visit you? Wouldn't you want somebody to come encourage you? So if you would want that, wouldn't you want to reciprocate that? Wouldn't you want to go do that? Wouldn't you want to go give the encouragement that you would want? Wouldn't you want to go provide for them like they would provide for you while you were incarcerated? So we, they were to emphasize with them in their sufferings and seek to help them in any way possible. And being human as they are, I think this morning we could all feel right along with them during this time. I think we can all wrap our heads around it this morning and see just the situation that they were going through. Verse 4 says, Marriage is honorable in all, and the bed undefiled, but whoremongers and adulterers God will judge. So what we see here is that we are all to honor marriage. We're to honor marriage, such marriages being between couples who then themselves were pure and had not previously indulged in sex. Even more importantly, marriage was to be honored by continually restraining from fornication and adultery. Why is that? Why would, why would the writer put this? Why is it so important that he's wrote it in this letter to the Hebrews? Because this was to be perfect examples of true love. These were to be perfect examples of true love. You see, sexual relations were to be refrained for enjoyment within the marriage. Today, you see uh, Mindy, you see John, you see Lucy, you see Sam. They're just going around, and they think that they're expressing love by their sexual relations, and all they're doing is trying to fill the pleasure center of the brain. It's not about love. It's about pleasure, and we know that pleasure arises from the enemy because we know that sin is pleasurable. Sexual relations were to be retained for the enjoyment within marriage. God had created this for the husband and wife to enjoy one another. Amen. So God would severely judge those who failed this in respect. And there's a mention of God's intervention here that stresses how serious a matter this was to be. Here the love of the brethren has pinpointed the love between a Christian husband and and a Christian wife. This was not only given marriage the Lord's approval and blessing, but probably had in mind some who thought that abstinence from marriage made them spiritually superior. And we can't say that that's true. But what we can say is that all were to honor the marriage. The honoring of marriage also meant that the divorce at that time would be unthinkable except on the grounds of unfaithfulness. It would be to dishonor God. It may be that some were following the teaching of the Rabbi Hillel, which allowed easy divorce. This idea here is rejected because under God, he clearly saw stable marriages as vital in upholding the witness of the church. He used the marriage to uphold the witness of the church. Verse 5 says, let your conversations be without covetousness and be content with such things as ye have. For he has said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. We're to be aware of covetousness, especially the love of money. I don't know about you, but before the cross, I chased money. I chased that paper, right? 
But let me tell you something. The love of money, there's nothing else that can destroy a man or woman or church like the love of money. The love of money will destroy whatever it comes in contact with. Because it begins to take the it begins to take the man's thoughts away from God. It begins to take the man's thoughts away from God. So they should not be concerned about whether they were rich or not. They, they, they should be aware of craving after money. 1 Timothy 6.10. And they should be aware of the deceitfulness of riches. Mark 4.19. For such soon takes hold on men and becomes their idol. It becomes their idol. It becomes what they have put before God. And that doesn't just have to be money, but the, the writing here is talking about money. So what we see is that the writer is really showing that they should be content with what they have. You should be content with what you've got. If you look at 1 Timothy 6.6, 6, it says that because godliness with contentment is great gain. Godliness with contentment is great gain. And we can be sure that the Lord will never fail them or forsake them in whatever needs they might have. Matthew 6, eight. With Jesus as our banker, we can never finally run short. For as our Lord Jesus emphasized, you cannot love both God and mammon. That word mammon is money. Matthew 6, 24. And whichever one you choose will always take precedence over the other. Either our love for God will result in money becoming unimportant except as a tool for doing good and showing love to our brothers and sisters or the love of money will become idolatry and take your thoughts away from Jesus and his ways and will destroy Christian love both for God and for man. And it's spiritually poisonous. It is spiritually poisonous. It can be that he knew that some of them had lost their wealth for Jesus' sake. And they were deeply affected by their situation. So now he is seeking to ensure that they recognize just how important it really is. I want you to take into account in today's time period. Look at the news of Christians that are fleeing terrorists. And they leave with nothing but the clothes on their back. They aren't worried about their material things. They're not worried about the money they had. They just want to get out because they put God first. This word for fail means to let go of, to lose the grip on. And it tells us that God will never lose his grip on us in John chapter 10 verse 29. The word forsake means to abandon or to desert. And it's who we who are his can be sure that we will never find ourselves abandoned or deserted. I want you to look at the strong emphasis of the, on the negatives, which is there. In the Greek, it's saying that for God to fail or forsake us is absolutely impossible. You guys understand that the, the, the Bible was written in Hebrew. And then it was written in Greek, which would have been coin Greek. So to properly get the, the understanding, you really got to look at it. It's saying, for God to fail or forsake us is absolutely impossible. Verse 6 says this. So that we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper and I will not fear what man shall do unto me. How many of you can say that this morning? How many of you can truly say that this morning, that the Lord is my helper and I will not fear what man shall do unto me? Because 
as a result of the certainty that we have that we know that he will not fail us or forsake us, we can say with good courage and confidence, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear what man will do to me. Psalm 118, 6. I know in certainty in my heart that my God has me. I know in certainty that it doesn't matter what man does to me, that I know my God is greater. You guys keep hearing me saying it, but it should be the theme of Hebrews. Greater is he that is in me than he who is in the world. Greater is he that is in me than he who is in the world. Because when you have Christ in you, the world doesn't matter no more. You're just a sojourner to an alien land. You are just passing through, and you're trying to bring as many as you can with you as you pass through. Come on, give him praise. Give him praise this morning. Verse 7 says, this says, Remember them which have the rule over you, who have spoken unto you the word of God, whose faith follow, considering the end of their conversation. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday and today and forever. We are to show their brotherly love by honoring their godly leaders who spoke to them the true word of God keeping them before them as an example and looking to them for guidance, both through the word of God and through their manner of life. Do you know, as a pastor, my my job as a pastor and teacher is to lead the sheep, to teach the sheep, to guide the sheep, to direct the sheep. But did you know if that my walk didn't match my talk, my words would mean nothing and my character would be diminished and you guys would just disappear? We're to honor those in charge. We're to honor those godly leaders who are in charge, not just by the word of God that they're speaking, but by the manner of their life. Did their, did their life match up with what they were teaching you from the word of God? Or were they as the Pharisees and Sadducees, confessing with their lips, but their hearts were far from God? Because if their heart was far from God, their actions will never they will never line up with the words that they're speaking. The word remember means call to mind, consider, think upon. It means that you're thinking on this situation. And you're doing this in the same way as we're told to remember your creator in the days of your youth. In the same way, these readers are to remember those who had the rule over them. Especially as it was they who had brought to them the word of God. Look at that statement, considering the issues, right? Considering the issues or the end of their life may signify that some of them had been martyred. Or may simply mean consider the manner and result of their life. If the former, this would indicate that his readers are also to be ready for persecution and possible martyrdom. Are you ready for persecution? It's so easy to say yes because you're not in a country where they are unalive in you for your belief. But are you ready for that persecution? Are you ready to be martyred for your faith? Because I think a lot of us would say, yes, I'm ready. But then when put in that situation, and this isn't saying nothing bad. But when you're put in that situation, I believe the first thing that you're going to have is doubt. Doubt's going to creep in. And the only way to overcome the doubt that creeps in is through the hope that you have that pushed you and impressed you into your faith in Jesus Christ. Because the Holy Spirit is the only one that's going to get you through that persecution and that martyrdom. Us as mere men, as finite creatures, we don't have that desire to be unalived. You know, in in psychology, there's a thing called fight or flight. You're either going to fight for something or you're going to run from something. And I truly believe that if, 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 if a majority, including myself, was put in that situation, I think our first thought would be to fly away, to run away. But because the Holy Spirit's in us, the Holy Spirit will guide us and lead us to the will that has to be done. Amen? Come on, give him praise. 
Again, it's not nothing we do, but everything that he does. Again, it's not everything that we do. It's it's what he does through us. Amen. So if if we look at this, they can do this with confidence, knowing that our master and King Lord Jesus Christ does not change. Remember, he's he's the one yesterday that's indicating the past that's showing the past tense. And it was revealed to them through the word, Jesus, the Messiah. And he's the same today and forever. James 1, 17. If anyone there comes with some new doctrine that portrays the Messiah and anointed Christ differently, they should be rejected. They should be rejected. And he continues, always the same, unchanging forever. And it is he whom their godly teachers hear and follow. That is why they too are to follow them. Put yourself under a sound teacher. Someone that is teaching the word of God. Someone that's not worried about hurting your feelings every now and then. Someone that's not worried about you getting in your emotions every now and then. But someone that is going to bring you the truth of the gospel because he's serving God, he's hearing from God, and he's delivering the word of God to the listeners. Amen? Verse 9 says this. Be not carried about with diverse and strange doctrines, for it is a good thing that the heart be established with grace, not with meats, which have not profited them, that have been occupied therein. So what we see here is that therefore are they to be aware and beware of many colored and unusual teachings not established by God's word. We're seeing it today. They've seen it then. We're seeing it today. Teachings which are foreign to the gospel. Teachings which are foreign to the gospel. Because, again, our Lord Jesus Christ does not change and has come as God's final revelation. We see this in Hebrews 1, 1 through 3. Any further new revelation. Uh-oh, prophets this morning. Uh-oh, for you guys that are out there, prophet lion. Uh-oh, for you guys saying, thus saith the Lord, and it doesn't line up with Scripture. Uh-oh. Because Jesus does not change and has come as God's final re revelation. And any further new revelation or revelation contrary to the Scriptures is therefore not to be even considered. There is no more revelation. You have the full revelation in front of you. So if you want to lose that money that a lot of people are holding on to, go see some of these modern day prophets because they're going to ask you before you can receive that blessing, you got you to gotta donate to their ministry. Hey, God has a blessing for you, but you, first you have to donate $500. God has a word for you, but I need $100. These aren't even to be considered. These aren't even to be thought about. These are to be ran from, turned away from, and stuck. you're supposed to stick to the truth of the gospel. Amen? And this was especially applying to the regulations concerning food. Because in the days of the early church false teachers of all kinds, they wandered from city to city and bringing strange ideas on religious matters. And many of these related to the eating of foods, which connected with religious rituals of various kinds and to various food regulations. And these teachings were prevalent in those days. Paul really had to combat these constantly. I, I truly believe that Paul was a warrior. I, I believe that he was a warrior because he was always constantly in battle with these false teachings. You'll see him battling these in Romans chapter 14. You'll see him battling these in 1 Corinthians chapter 8. 
He was constantly battling these false teachings. And, and he was saying these, these regulations accomplish nothing spiritually. So the writer here, he's, he's assuring his readers they are of no profit to the spirit. They were looking to feed the flesh. They were looking to feed the carnal. They were looking to get immediate things happening in them. But the problem is, is that they were no profit to the spirit here. The spirit was not being affected. The spirit was not being nourished. The spirit was not being fed. They were only feeding the carnality of them and not feeding the spirit inside of them. So there was no effect to the spirit at all. Amen. So they had to recognize, the readers had to recognize here that the heart and spirit are fed by what comes to them through the gracious activity of God, through the Holy Spirit working within them. Let them feed on such things as he has taught them, right? And so now what the writer's doing is he is, he's going on to apply this to their own circumstance. Because their danger clearly laid in their desiring to receive meat from the ritual sacrificial meals that were connected with the Levitical priesthood. They thought that these ritual meals were still going to bring them closer to God when the reality of Jesus Christ was already present. He was already present. So when the peace or thank offerings had been made, the meat would be available to the worshipers. Just like today when some of these churches have these, they have service and then they have these, uh, what are they called, Um, where everybody brings in food and you guys sit down in fellowship. Um, I can't think of what it's called. I just had a brain freeze. But they bring in food and this is the same thing that was happening in the Hebrew church at that time. They were still looking to get their belly filled, but they wanted to get it filled with the sacrificial offerings because they still thought that it was bringing them closer to God. And there was the danger of them looking to this rather than to receiving the gracious provision of God through the Spirit. Potluck, there you go, potluck dinner. So it was... There was a danger that they were looking to this because they were looking to the sacrificed meat rather than looking at what the Holy Spirit was feeding them in their spirit. And they were to remember that those who look to such sacrificial meals are not ultimately profited by them spiritually. Eating these foods couldn't establish them and make them impregnable. Wherever the meat comes from, food can strengthen the body, but it can't strengthen the heart and the spirit. There's only one food that can strengthen the heart and the spirit, and that's the word of God. But you see, the grace of God, God's freely given mercies revealed in God, the Lord Jesus Christ, can do exactly that. Look at Titus 2, verse 11. Titus 2, verse 11. He says, for the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. You are fool at that point. There's nothing left to put inside of you. Now you're not looking for a full meal. You're already full. Now you're just having appetizers. And these appetizers are the word of God, which continuously keep you full and makes it a cup that runneth over. It's a cup that runneth over because the spirit is being fed through the word of God and it's being multiplied inside of you. Remember the armor of God, it says the sword of the spirit. Well, where is the sword kept? It's kept inside of a sheath. Where is the word put? The word is put in the heart. Your heart is the sheath for that word of the spirit, the sword to attack the enemy. Come on. This is, this is good stuff here. You've got to constantly put the word in so that all that comes out is a, the word of God, is the move of the Holy Spirit. So there may be, it may well be that these words are an indication that certain types of Jews have come among the decrying their stance and and pointing out that as Christians, they now had no altar on which the sacrifice could be offered. That they had no sacred meal resulting from those sacrifices. 
by which they could directly participate of their sacrifices and enjoy a physical contact with the with the numinous and that they were even losing out and participating in the Passover at Jerusalem. It would seem that this had deeply impressed on them. And his reply will now be that they can easily dismiss such suggestions because they have something better. For their meat is found in being established in the grace of God. In other words, in partaking of what is provided by God's gracious actions through his spirit. Through the spiritual participation in Jesus Christ and him crucified. And that is something that is not dependent on Jerusalem. It is outside the camp of Israel. It is universally available to all who want to accept. He's telling them the old has passed away and the new has arrived. We are going to preach Christ and Christ crucified here in this church. He said it's not about their sacrifice and the food that you're getting afterwards. It's about the grace and mercy of Jesus Christ and what he's doing in your heart. And these words would have struck a chord with a lot of them Jews at that time. Because offering sacrifices and partaking of sacred meat was widely known both among Jew and Gentile. And many who had come to Christ might well have looked back in willful longing for those physical ritual acts which had no meaning to them. But the writer here, his answer is very clear. As he's been pointing out all along, they are to look to the heavenly and not the earthly. They're there to look at the heavenly and not the earthly. Are you guys catching this? And he's going to expand on that point here. He's going to expand on that point because his reference to sacrificial meals leads on into the reconsideration of the contrast between Jesus Christ and the old ways. It is time, he says, that they finally choose between participating in the rituals of Jerusalem and the Levitical priesthood within the camp or participating in Jesus and his sacrifice and going to him outside the camp. And the writer here, he's already demonstrated from Scripture the old has passed away and the new has come. And the new is not found by looking to Jerusalem. The new is only found by looking to Jesus. By looking to Jesus. Verse 10 says this. Verse 10 says this. It says, we have an altar we have an altar whereof they have no right to eat, which serve the tabernacle. So his reply is that we actually have an altar which provides us with spiritual food of which they have no knowing and which they cannot partake. The Lord Jesus was offered up as a sacrifice. You'll see that in Hebrews 9 verses 12 through 14 and Hebrews 10 verse 10. And what this must mean is that he was offered up on a spiritual altar provided by God. This wasn't an altar that was given by man or built by man's hands. This was a spiritual altar provided by God. We cannot see this as just an answer it is a proud boast. It's a declaration. It's a triumph. The writer says it's now time for them to recognize that they and we have a better altar. Of which they who serve the earthly tabernacle and what it re represents have no right to eat while they are in their unbelief. Do you guys see a correlation here? Are you starting to see why Jesus said, this is my body, which will be broke for you? This is my blood of the New Testament drink of me. 
the correlations coming in. There is no contradiction. It's all correlation. It's confirmation. He's saying, look, I'm going to be presented before the altar of God, the altar that no man's has hands have touched, but only the hands of God has put before. And now I'm going to be sacrificed on the altar for you. For you. Those who serve in the tabernacle with all this rituals are provided with meat from the sacrifices which have been offered on the altar in Jerusalem. Speaking loosely, they can eat meat from the altar. But we should recognize that we have a better altar, a spiritual altar on which has been offered a better sacrifice once for all. One which supplies us with better spiritual food than their physical earthly altar ever could. We now have the Lamb of God. We now have Jesus as our high priest. But what is an altar? A lot of people don't understand what an altar is because you see a lot of churches today, hey, come on down to the altar. This is the altar call. What altar? Because an altar is a place where a sacrifice is offered to God. And as they should well know, when Jesus died, he was being offered as a sacrifice. Which indicates that God had arranged for such an altar outside of Jerusalem at Golgotha. Where this could occur. And that being so, they're, they're, though his, his being offered up on their altar, a superior altar to that in Jerusalem, we can now participate in Christ's sacrifice for us. It was outside of the camp. We can participate of God's Passover lamb. We can feed on the bread of life. We can partake of Jesus Christ, John 6, 48 through 58. So how do we feed and drink? Of Jesus. Uh, Jesus put the answer in clear terms in John chapter 6, verse 35. He says, He who comes to me will never hunger, and he who believes in me will never thirst. In other words, we feed and drink by coming and believing. We come in personal faith, responding in our spirits to our Master and Lord Jesus as revealed to us through His Word. We look for Him in our hearts. And we exercise constant trust, faith, and response day by day as we continue looking to him. So we eat and we drink of him and participate in him. And this is especially as we meet together this morning to look to him and honor him and worship him. We are feeding and drinking of Jesus. We don't have an altar anymore, but we gather so that we can partake in the glorious Jesus Christ. Amen. But the important thing that mattered was that it was situated outside of the camp and therefore outside the scope of the Levitical priesthood, outside the scope of the polluted city. And those who who served Jerusalem's altar had no right because they had not come to him and received life and forgiveness. They rejected him. So they have no right to partake in the eating and drinking. You guys with me? This is good stuff. You guys with me this morning? You need some coffee? Verse 11 says this. It says, for the bodies of those beasts whose blood is brought into the sanctuary by the high priest for sin or burned without the camp. Wherefore, Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people with his own blood, suffered without the gate. The writer now, (coughs) he likens the Son of God, our Lord Jesus, to the special sacrifices whose blood is brought into the holy place. If by the holy place he means the holy of holies, then these are the day of atonement sacrifices. 
Otherwise, they also include the sin offerings for the priest and for the people as a whole. In all cases, the bodies of such beasts had to be burned outside the camp because they were especially holy. You guys understand that? In all cases, the bodies of these animals had to be burned outside the camp because they were especially holy. Where was Jesus crucified? Outside the camp. Where did Mechizedek come to Abraham? Outside the camp. Are you guys seeing the correlation here? Outside the camp was now more holy than inside the camp. But yet because of their unbelief, they couldn't come outside the camp to partake in the eating and the drinking of the altar which God presented for Jesus Christ. We need to recognize the significance this morning of Christ being offered outside the gates of Jerusalem. Because his readers knew intimately under the, the Jerusalemite rite ritual, what is dealt with outside the camp belongs wholly to God. They knew that because Jesus was held outside the camp, that he truly belonged to God. And man cannot partake of it. It is sacred. They can only participate of sin offerings offered on the altar in Jerusalem. The blood of which is not taken within the holy place and the carcasses of which were not burned outside the camp. We, we, we could really call them lesser sin offerings because those alone may be retained within the camp and be partaken of. And the consequence is that if the Messiah, Jesus, was offered outside the camp, as he was, it is clear that he is inaccessible to them unless they are willing to leave the camp and put the trust in him. They had to leave their faith in the Jerusalemite ritual once and for all. They had to come outside the camp put their faith in him and if they didn't he was forbidden to them by their own laws if they didn't do this they were forbidden to do it because of the laws that they were under a lot of people are saying pastor you're going pretty deep I, I don't understand all this and that's fine because in order to understand this, we have to be aware of the, the, the necessities and the significance of Old Testament ritual. Because all sin offerings were offered on the altar. But these were divided into two groups. In one group are the sin offerings, which were for the whole people, and those which were the priest as the anointed of God. And in this case, the blood was offered within the sanctuary and the carcasses could not be eaten. And apart from the fat which was burned on the altar, had to be burned in their totality outside the camp in a clean place. These included the great sacrifices on the Day of Atonement, the blood of which alone was presented in the Holy of Holies. So in other case, it was before the veil at the altar of incense. Any sin offering whose blood was presented in the holy place was to be treated in the same way. Then there were sin offerings for individuals and these were offered on the altar and the blood of the sacrifice presented to God by means of that altar and the fat was offered on the altar. The blood was not taken within the holy place. The edible meat from these sacrifices was then partaken of by the priest while the remainder would be burned up on the altar. All of these offerings is that even the lesser sin offerings were all most holy to the Lord. Leviticus chapter 6 verse 25. This is why all that could be eaten was to be eaten within the precincts of the tabernacle and only by the anointed priest who because of what they were, were thereby also holy while the other remains were burned on the altar in the court of the tabernacle. 
You guys understand the ritual that's taken place here for the sacrifices and the atonement. So when we learn that Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people through his own blood, separate outside the gate, we're made to recognize that his offering of himself was also to be seen as exceptionally holy. Not only were the remains dealt with outside the camp, but the whole sacrifice and offering was made outside the camp. Even the tabernacle and temple itself was not holy enough for this offering. How holy then must the, be the holiness with which he sanctified his own and God did this that it might be clear that no one who partook of the Jerusalemite rit ritual could have part in this sacrifice. For the, for the reason that they could not partake of the altar was because what was sacrificed on it was a sin offering for the whole world. The type of offering of which none in the camp or even in the sanctuary could eat but which had to be burned outside the camp, therefore, thereby being given to God because of its great holiness. So now that the camp had in the eyes of the Jews, religiously speaking, become Jerusalem, the remains of these sacrifices were now in fact specifically burned outside Jerusalem. So Jesus' sacrifice was seen as taking place outside the camp because it took place outside the city gates. Now, we've already noted the word camp here, talking about Jerusalem. And we see that it could never retain what was exceptionally holy. The camp was too secular. Jerusalem was too secular. It was not, therefore, a fit place for God's supreme holiness. But do you know how the Jews covered up what they were doing? Does anybody know here how the Jews covered up crucifying Jesus outside the city. Because this is very important to understanding what we're talking about here. Because why they did it outside the city is because the Jews stated that it was because Jesus was accursed. So because they said he was accursed... They had sent him to die outside Jerusalem as a judgment on him. But what they failed to realize. Now watch this. What they failed to realize was that it was a judgment on themselves. Because the real reason that it had happened in God's eyes was that it was Jerusalem that was accursed. And that he was too holy for Jerusalem and what Jerusalem represented. That is why he died outside the camp. It was another sign of Jerusalem's rejection of the Messiah. Come on, give him praise this morning. Because what they tried to do, God already knew and he had prepared the way. It was already set, signed, sealed, and delivered. Jesus was to be presented before the Father and make outside the camp holier than the city of Jerusalem. And the city of Jerusalem was to be accursed. Give him praise. Verse 13 says this. It says, let us go forth therefore unto him without the camp bearing his reproach. Here we are faced with the grand paradox. He was sent out of Jerusalem by the Jews as a reproach, just as the reproach of Israel was to fall on the great servant of Yahweh in Isaiah 53. Are you guys seeing the fulfillment here? You guys understand that the prophet Isaiah prophesied that it would be outside the gates, right? He was sent out to be cursed for being a blasphemer and ir 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 irreligious. And yet by being thus sent out, he was revealed to all, but the prejudiced as truly and exceptionally holy. In the same way, those who would follow him must be willing to bear the same reproach that they too might partake in his holiness. They too must be willing to suffer at the hand of his rejectors, for that is what will demonstrate their holiness. 
So while those of Jerusalem sent him outside the camp because they thought that he was unfit, yes, even accursed, and continued to pour reproach and even persecution on his followers, they did so because they had failed to recognize him as the sacrifice and sin offering, which was for the sins of the world. In spite of Isaiah 53.10 and John 1.29. But God sent him outside the camp. So that his perfect holiness and adequacy as a perfect sin offering might be revealed. And that he was so holy that the camp could not contain him. And to demonstrate the unworthiness of Jerusalem. What is more in their hearts, what is more in their hearts, had they been willing to admit it, being willing to admit it, even the Judaizers knew that was the real reason that they had turned him out. For as the tradition, the Gospels reveals that they had hated him for being too good. They hated him for being too good. It was precisely because they could not bear his purity and his closeness to God that they had done it in the way, same way as they had long before, remained in the camp of Israel and had let Moses deal with God outside the camp on the mount. Because God was too holy and because of their sinful nature, they couldn't handle it. They couldn't bear it. So now they had remained in the camp of Israel in Jerusalem and had left Jesus to deal with God outside the camp. Because they could not bear his holiness. This time they had not outwardly fully known what they were doing. But God knew. God knew. And they knew underneath as the very ferocity of their persecution revealed. The truth is that his rejection was because he was too holy and they were not holy enough. Yet had they only but been willing to see it, they would have recognized that everything of ultimate value had to happen outside the camp as it always had because they in the camp were unfit. The final lesson that sprang up from this was that if his readers wanted to enjoy true holiness, it wouldn't be It wouldn't be by returning to Jerusalem as a religious center, but by turning their backs finally on Jerusalem as a religious center and coming to him outside the camp, sharing his glorious reproach. Are you guys seeing this this morning? Are you seeing this? If they would have only opened their eyes, if they would only have opened their eyes, they would have seen the fullness of God. They would have seen the fullness of God. Verse 14 says this. It says, for here have we no continuing city, but we seek one to come. So our eyes are not to be on the earthly Jerusalem. It had become a rejected and defiled city, a corrupt city. You're going to see that in Revelation 11.8. I see the question in the chat that said, why do they still call Jerusalem the holy city? Go to Revelation chapter 11, verse 8, and you're going to see what they're ta- why they're talking about the holy city of Jerusalem. Revelation 11 and 8. Look at it. It says this. And their dead bodies shall lie in the street of the great city which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt, where also our Lord was crucified. They can call it holy all they want, but they're even going to unalive the two witnesses that come back to, to, to preach the gospel. And their bodies shall lie in the street of the great city, which spiritually So physically, it's called Jerusalem. The holy city is called Jerusalem physically. But remember, we're not looking at the physical. We're looking at the spiritual. And spiritually, it's called Sodom and Egypt. Are you guys seeing this? 
is a city which would not abide and would indeed shortly be destroyed. Because Christians do not have here an abiding city. Jerusalem as a religious center is now not for God's people. I don't know about you, but I don't want a city. I want to be in the presence of God. I don't want a city that we're bound to earth at all. We have left that city and rather seek that city which is to come, the Jerusalem above. Galatians chapter 4 verse 26. The city that we can come to even now, Hebrews 12, 22, which represents all the true people of God. The city which is at present unseen to naked eye. Although it's visible to the spiritual eye, the people that are only looking with the carnal eye, they can't see it. But those who are full of glory will be revealed in the future, the new heavenly Jerusalem, which has no part in this world. It has no part in this world. Verse 15 says, this is by him, therefore, let us offer the sacrifice of praise to God continually. That is the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. So we're to wish, when we wish to offer up the sacrifice to God, we must do it through him. This is why scripture says that we are to present ourselves as a living sacrifice. We have to do it outside the camp. He's telling the readers here, you got to do it outside the camp. That we can fulfill our priestly service, being as it is outside the old order of priesthood and having no connection with it. There, we can offer up a sacrifice to God continually. A sacrifice of praise, a sacrifice of worship, a sacrifice of prayer, a sacrifice of relationship through Jesus. We're not earthly priests offering earthly sacrifices. Legally, we, we, we couldn't do that. But what we offer is a heavenly sacrifice, the fruit of our lips, making confession to his name, declaring ourselves to be his, proclaiming him to men. This is sweet savor to God. You want to honor God? Begin to praise his name. You want to honor God? Start making confessions in his name. You want to honor God? Go out and proclaim Jesus to men. This is the sweet savor to God. It's not to sacrifice meat anymore. It's not the blood that's sprinkled on the altar anymore. It's you being a living sacrifice and dedicating your life to him. Amen. Verse 16 says, but to do good and to communicate, forget not. For which such sacrifices God is well pleased. Along with this, we're, we are not to forget to offer our sacrifices. Well, how do we do that, Pastor? How do, we, how do we not forget to offer our sacrifices? And what was the writer really telling the Hebrew people here? And he's telling them by continually doing good and having fellowship one with another continually. That means communicating with each other. Sharing with each other. Encouraging one another, exhorting one another. You see, these are our offerings to God, knowing that with such sacrifice, God is pleased. Why? Because it's the love that you're showing. It's the love that you're showing. So the writer here, he's finally made the great divide between Jerusalem and all that it had come to stand for and Christianity with its whole concern centered on Jesus. The writer closes his letter with personal exhortations and assurance. People ask me all the time, why do you think Paul wrote Hebrews? Look at every letter that Paul wrote, and he he ended it with encouragement. He ended it with assurance, and he ended it with personal exhortations. Every letter Paul wrote. So the writer here, he, he, he says, rather than looking to Jerusalem, they're to obey those who are true servants of Jesus Christ, who are appointed to watch over their spiritual warfare. And he requests in true Pauline fashion that they pray for him and his fellow workers, especially so that he might be restored to them because he's confident that God on his part will make them perfect in every good thing to do his will. 
working in them and through them that which is well pleasing in his sight. Verse 17 says this, says, Obey them that have the rule over you and submit yourselves for they watch for your souls as they must give account that they may do it with joy and not with grief for that it is unprofitable for you. So the writer here, he stresses firstly that they, like all those who are in churches with godly oversight, as he knew the right, the readers here were, should, should really be careful to obey those who have the rule over them and to submit to them and to their teachings and guidance. So the writer here, he personally knows that they are such as aware that they will have to give account and are therefore trustworthy. I tell you guys all the time, I'm very careful on what I teach because I'm held at a higher standard. I'm judged at a higher standard by what I teach you. And the, Paul here, he's writing them and saying, hey, you can look up to these people because they know that they're judged more harshly. They know that they're judged more harshly. And so because of that, they can be trusted. They're trustworthy. Amen. And his yearning is that those leaders may be able to give account with joy. Right? Joy. We're supposed to be filled with joy as a leader, as a pastor, as a shepherd. We're supposed to be filled with joy. Why are we supposed to be filled with joy? Because of the success of our efforts. And that this isn't just for our sake, but because not to have cause to rejoice would be the deterrent of those for whom they were responsible. If I came in here and was teaching you guys all down and depressed, you're going to be getting down and depressed. Your shepherd should be filled with joy. Let me tell you something. I love Pastor Nick for this reason because Pastor Nick, you know, he, he, he is the, the chorus or the choir. He is the pastor. He is the shepherd. He is the teacher. He is the leader. He fulfills all the requirements of that church. But Pastor Nick is so full of joy. He's so full of joy. That when you're around him, you can't help but be overjoyed. I talk to Pastor Nick daily. And not one day has he ever been depressed. Not at one day has he ever put off that the world has beat him down. But he's always full of joy. He may say, my, 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 my body is beaten and broken, but my spirit is full of joy. And that's how we're to be as teachers and leaders, full of joy, so that our congregation, so that our sheep, so that those that are learning under us see that joy and want to participate in the joy. Amen. It's amazing. It's amazing who God puts in your path. You know, Pastor Nick's a great brother to me, and I just love him. So we're to be filled with joy, not because of the success of our efforts, and not just because of our own sakes, but because of who we are responsible for. And these words, he assures them. He says, arise, not because of his concern for the leaders, but because he knows that for this not to happen will be unprofitable to them. It would mean that the leaders had failed in their responsibility and that their flock had suffered, which would be profitable neither for the leader or the flock. But we have to remember, especially in these days, that the leader themselves have to be tested by their own behavior. Jesus said, you know that those who are supposed to rule over the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great men exercise authority over them, but it shall not be so among you. But whoever would be great among you must be your servant. Mark chapter 10, 42 and 43. He was pointing out that such leaders can be tested and should be so. I, I challenge you guys all the time. Test me. Test my moral character, test my walk, test everything about me so that it lines up with what I'm teaching you. Hold me accountable. Hold me accountable. 
But he was because he was pointing out that the test of the truly great man of God is found in his humility as expressed at all times, not just an acted out scenario to some, but especially towards the lowest. Once a minister becomes too conscious of his own authority, he loses the right to that authority. <coughs> it's only to those who clearly live showing that they know they must give account and who live in true humility that submission can be expected. It is God given only to them. You are to test your shepherd. You are to test your pastor. You are to test your teacher. You are to hold them accountable. Hold them accountable. Verse 18 says this. It says, pray for us. For we trust we have a good conscience and all things willing to live honestly. But I beseech you the rather to do this that I may be restored to you the sooner. So he, now he's asking for prayer. He wants prayer for himself and his fellow workers. He requests this on the grounds that their conscience is right towards God in all that they do. And that their aim in life is truly to live honorably before God in everything. They are living as they require of others. They are worthy to be prayed for that their ministry may be successful. But if you notice, he, he does this with kind of an urgency, a greater urgency, and that he might be restored to them sooner. So he's under some kind of restraint, such as prison, which he expects to be limited, uh, be of a limited duration, possibly affected by their prayers, or it may, may suggest that he has a work to do for God, which he cannot leave until it is firmly established. Either way, he wants them to know that he desires to come to them and, and would do so were it not for the circumstance and the will of God. They are clearly very dear to him. And he wants them to know of his eagerness to be with them. Verse 20, we're almost there, guys. Verse 20, now the good of peace that brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant, make you perfect in every good work to do his will, working in you that which is well-pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Who else finishes their, 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 their writings like that? Come on. Who closes their writings out like that? Paul. Well, how can you say Paul wrote Hebrews? Look at the literary style of Hebrews. Look how he is closing the letters out here. He then reciprocates by praying for them. He, he, his prayer summarizes briefly all that he has been saying as he prays that it will be fully effective in them. By this, he reveals that in the end, the responsibility for their perseverance lies if, if they are truly his with God. So he prays to the God of peace. The, this is the God who made it possible for them to find peace with him. And who himself can bring peace to their hearts in their present period of doubting. He is the one who has made peace between Jew and Gentile through the cross of Jesus. Making them both one as his people. Ephesians chapter 2 verses 11 through 22. He is the one who makes life in this world one that is surrounded by peace for his own as they dwell within God's heavenly camp, which has replaced for them the earthly camp. Revelation chapter 20, verse 9. They live in the spiritual realm and in heavenly places even while they walk on the earth. Ephesians 2, verse 6. For their hearts and minds are in heaven. Colossians 3, 1 through 3. The writer describes what the God of peace has done for us. He has brought again from the dead the great shepherd of the sheep with the blood of an eternal covenant, even our Lord Jesus. Remarkably, this is the first specific reference to the resurrection in this letter. Did you guys catch that? This is the first reference to the resurrection in this letter. 
even though it's assumed everywhere else from Hebrews 1 to here, this is the first place that it's mentioned. Because otherwise he could not have sat down at God's right hand, nor could he have passed through the heavens as our great high priest into the presence of God. The description is splendid here. The great shepherd is brought forth from the dead, bearing the blood of an eternal covenant. And those who look to him enter within that covenant and are sealed by his blood. Come on. Do you guys see this? Verse 22 says, And I beseech you, brethren, suffer the word of exhortation, for I have written a letter unto you in few words. So in his last thoughts here, he's asking his readers, his brothers and sisters, to bear with his words. He knows that he has spoken strongly, but he insists that he could really have written a lot more. And the word of exhortation, what that does is it describes the main purpose of the letter, which has been a mixture of theology and practical application and now a warning. And, and now he wants to ensure with this personal word that they will not take it amiss. As all the way through, he wants them to be aware of the confidence he has in each one of them. Do you see the encouragement that he's given them here? He, he, he's given them the encouragement to persevere, to keep going, to, to strive on because he knows that they're doing what God wants them to do, that they're holding fast to the faith in Jesus Christ. Verse 23 says, Know ye that our brother Timothy is set at liberty, with whom if he comes shortly, I will see you. Another one. Well, Pastor, why do you say that's Paul writing Hebrews? Who was Timothy under? Anybody? Who was Timothy under? Timothy was under Paul. Amen. He was under Paul. So we see, know ye that our brother Timothy is set at liberty with whom if he comes shortly, well, where is he coming? I will see you. So it's clear that Timothy had recently been in prison but has now been released and that he expects to meet up with him and then come to see them. This might, this, this, this is what's showing you and it's supporting the Pauline authorship here. It's supporting the Pauline authorship here of Hebrews. Verse 24 says, salute all them that have the rule over you and all the saints, they of Italy salute you. Where was Paul? Paul went to Rome. Where's Rome? They're in Italy. So he calls them on them to pass his greetings onto the leadership of the church and all other Christians who are there. And this would really seem to confirm that he has written to a group within that church. Possibly a house group or a special interest group because he wants his greetings passed on to all the saints, all God's people in that area. 25 ends just like all of Paul's writings. And he says, grace be with you all. Amen. With a final flourish, he prays that God's gracious and unmerited activity be with each and every one of them. The high priest, after offering the sacrifice, would come out of the temple and give a blessing to the people who have remained there. And this morning, I want to pray for you for each and every one of you that have been with me since the beginning of this book of Hebrews because we've come to the end of Hebrews. And I want to pray for you that our precious Lord and Savior Jesus Christ bless you and keep you. May his face shine down upon you and give you peace. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen.